Welcome to the fight game with Ice Water and Puma. I am Puma. He is Ice Water. We're going to talk about a few fights that we saw over the last couple of weeks. And I want to start out with the lioness, uh, Nunez. She retires uh, after an epic career. I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised. I got to see the fight. And when I saw her lay the two belts down and then the gloves in between, I was like, you know, and how emotional she was. And you could see what her future is. You you see that when she um, started the, the family mm-hmm. a few few years ago. You kind of see her going in that direction. Um, what are your thoughts about this, man? You already know. She is my favorite MMA female fighter of all time. And and I say that because I just started really watching them, uh, the ladies fight a couple years ago. I haven't always been, been watching from the beginning, right? But uh, in the time that I've been watching her, she's an amazing athlete. She really wasn't one of the top ladies or whatever. She wasn't the top lady. She earned her right to be there. We call her the, 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 the queen, if you will. She walked down everybody. She, knocked, she took off the best fighters, Ronda Rousey, uh, the preacher's daughter, I mean, everybody, the cyborg, she went in there and rocked me, even uh, the young lady that she's supposed to fight again. She went in there and she took no prisoners. She didn't have to be perfect, but damn, she was amazing. I I just love it. And she just, she went in there with attitude. She beat the, what's the other little girl? The one, not the little girl, the young lady that uh, everybody's crazy about, I think like from Russia or somewhere like that. Another. Uh, oh, Valentina? Yeah, Valentina, yeah. So she t- taking her down. So, uh, no, I, I think she's amazing. I'm happy for her. I'm glad she's able to walk away. I'm going to miss her. I'm going to miss her com- competing. I'm going to miss her competitiveness. I'm going to miss her taking on challenges and setting the record straight. She was a true champion. We've had Ronda Rousey. You had a lot of people. But to me, she was the one that says, whoever's on top, you know, besides holding two belts simultaneously, if that's possible. She was like, whoever's on top, even with the biggest one was Cyborg. When she had that opportunity with Cyborg, there everybody was talking about she was too little. Cyborg was going to hurt her. She stepped up to every freaking challenge, and she was dominant, and she earned it. I'm sad for her, sad for me, because I want to, I'm jealous, because I just want to see her keep fighting. But I'm happy for her, because she's a class act. And she deserves all of that, the happiness with her family and whatnot. I'm just going to be sad to see that. Uh, I, I, it's going to be sad, sad for me that I will not be able to see her compete anymore on, in, in that in that in that ring. Even with the match going out, um, she so, showed a lot of class. Um, she, I even thought the refs were kind of just saying, you know what, we're going to let her do what she she does, you know, because uh, he didn't get in to kind of uh, break up the clinches sometimes. Um, which uh, a lot of people tend to do as, as, as far as the, um, the action being in a law. And uh, I, I felt she fought a decent fight. Um, you could see that to me in the last few fights, the passion is not there anymore. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when you, you've done all you could do in the sport, um, even though she was dominating fighters um, throughout her whole career, um, you could just see that once she had that child, it was just a, a different a different fighter in there. And she was thinking not only of herself, but she was thinking about her significant other and her child. So I, I thought um, this is a career. She she went out with class. She did what she needed to do. I'm going to miss her too. I don't usually watch the women fight, as you well know, but um, I, I'm going to miss her too because she was a cut above, I think, some of the women that she, she fought. It was like, it was something different about her. It was um, a, much more of a bite, much more aggressive. Um, she, she, I want to say this, I might get in trouble with this, but she fought like a dude. She fought like a, a straight up dude mm-hmm. that you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to get in front of like in a bar or something like that. I mean, she, she, she could thug it out right there in the ring. Great down, uh, ground game. Um, you know, stand up game was on point and, um, you know, kudos to her. I hope she, um, you know, enjoys retirement. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised she made a comeback at some particular point. Um, yeah, even though um, she went out on top and and had the two belts, and she was so emotional at the end, um, we will miss her, and I think she will miss this sport. So whatever degree she wants to get back in the sport, whether it's to train people or to get back in the ring one last time for a big, you know, a, a payday, I'm, I'm all for it. But uh, definitely one of the class acts of 
uh, the UFC. And um, she, you know, she did it right. She did it right. And she took on all challenger and I'm, I'm going to miss her. No doubt. She, she did. And I just got one thing with you. You said she fought like a dude. Let's, let's, let's just, I mean, I understand you saying that, but let's just say she was, she's a, a woman that fought the, the best, the, was the best female fighter I've seen. Because when you say to me, I mean, you can say what you want yeah, to. Yeah, and I, I don't now, mean any I, offense by that, though. But, but I'm just saying for me, I want to give her, her her props as a woman who can beat the hell out of people. <laughs> and, and granted, I think she could beat a couple men. Yeah, that, we said that a long time ago. Right, but I'm going to still keep it real that she's still a woman. She just happened to have ability to throw them hands. She yeah. still, she's still a woman. Still a woman, because when yeah. you say she fight like a dude, it's like women can't fight. And I'm like, she no, that's not what I meant at all. But you, but you know what I'm saying. It's yeah. like the, she is the epitome of a fighter. She's a woman that fights and could maybe beat a couple guys. I like to see it. But I'm not going to take away from the fact that one, she's a woman to me, which is even more uh, exciting and also makes it more impressive because she could possibly knock the hell out of a couple men, which yeah. I'm like, and that's the fighter in her. Yeah. <laughs> So don't 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 come at me. Uh, I'm not saying you know fight like a girl. None of that. It's just the way she kind of approached it. It, it just looked like the, her her male counterparts, and so it's almost like. And we said this before. We could put a few dudes in there, and she would just you know hands down just beat them down. I mean that that's the way she approached it. And yeah. so uh, yeah, don't come for me. Don't come for me because I I ain't the one. All right. Uh, there was a great fight last week with uh, Josh Taylor and Telefino Lopez. And I said to you off air, if you want to go after the champ, this is the way you do it. This is the way you win a definitive fight against the champ. And the Lopez that we saw fight Lomacheco and, and other fights came to fight in this particular fight. Um, do you think Josh Taylor had a little bit of ring rust or it was just that Telefino Lopez was just too much for him? I'll say this. I can understand ring rust because he's out for, what, 16 months, something to that effect? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I can see that. But after a while, after a couple rounds, then it starts to come off, right? And it wasn't like he wasn't trying to fight, uh, trying to go after Lopez. I think Styles make fights. I think I told you this off air. Styles make fights. And then after a while, the one thing Lopez did more than anything, he went back to being the serious boxing uh, wizard that he can be, that he used to be when he was younger. You know, after a while, he started trying to knock people out and whatnot. But they said before he was anything and before he became a, a, a well-known fighter, he was a hell of a boxer. And he mentioned he had a nickname for the boxer, and he was, and I think that's what he did. He went out and used the, the one thing, ladies and gentlemen, for this probably second or maybe third time, at least the second time, and we've been watching boxing. Angles matter. Angles matter. You are watching. You're watching the angles that he used. He's able to slip, slide, move over here, and use by using boxing angles was able to literally uh, move forward and and, and uh, do do what he had to do uh, against Josh Taylor. Also, too, I really think when I say Styles make fights, I think this was major because after a while, Josh Taylor became predictable, and he was trying. But he was had to move, step forward, uh, stand up straight type of uh, Frankenstein monster approach. He almost seemed lost in the ring. It's like he he didn't know where he was. He didn't know where to go. He was, you know, going after Lopez, and Lopez was just like slipping him really easily. So it's like he was so confused in the ring. Yeah, but I, but I think part of that is he's used to fighting a certain style, right? He's a guy that comes towards you. He's not a guy that's slipping and everything like that. He comes directly at you. He might counter with you, and then he's going to try to take you down. But when you're fighting a guy like Lopez that was all over the place and was doing it in a calculated manner and scoring, that becomes difficult. And, and it's it's just a style. It's almost like he's more of a, what we call the one-trick pony. He can only go fight one way. And then when you fight a real boxer that's really elusive and classy, then they didn't have any other um, any other backup plans. And I think that's where why Lopez looks so uh, dominant and looks so fresh because he was uh, presenting a problem that uh, uh, Lo not, Lo not Lopez, but he was that Taylor had no counter for. 
he had no no way to counter what he was doing. So all he could do at that point is keep trying, and 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 it didn't work. Yeah, he had no answers in there. It, it was just um, because it, you know we talked about uh, the fight previous with um, Haney and Lomachenko, and folks, you know, the debate whether or not Lomo won, Haney won. But I, I was sitting there watching this fight. Like I, I probably gave Josh Taylor maybe two out of the ten rounds. Mm-hmm. maybe two out of the 10 rounds. There were other boxing guys that gave him three. Some gave him four. I'm, I couldn't see three or four. It was just that Josh Taylor was so, he didn't even look like a champion in there. And I'm like, this is the way, when you go for the champion, this is the way you do it. You dominate to the point where there is no doubt. The the judges who, who scored at 15-3, I don't know what, what, what boxing match they were watching. Um, there was that one judge who scored at 17-11. That was, you know, pretty accurate mm-hmm. to me. But I, I don't know what the 15, there were two judges, 15, 13. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I I have no clue. I don't know if they were just giving the the champ a, you know, you know, a little bit of a, a, a buy because he's a champion. But when you see a, a fight that dominant, that score shouldn't be that close. No, I agree with that. But I think it comes to the point that we said before, I said before, is the fact that, that depending on who the judges are and how they see the fight. I mean, I said the same when we talked about uh, when we said also about uh, uh, Lomachenko versus Haney. I mean, and that sh- I think it just shows you how the judges look at certain fights and how they come across. They see certain differently. I agree with you. I think the earlier, the closest could have been maybe it was going to be um, I'm talking about um, the uh, Lopez fight is one sixteen one twelve. Yeah, right. I think that's the closest that it could have been. But uh, like you said, and and, and I just I, here's the other thing too, Josh Taylor was the undisputed lightweight champion. And, and I keep pointing back to the style effect because you put Josh uh, Taylor in there with somebody else, he's dominant, he's doing what he has to do. That's why the the the, uh, the effort by Lopez was so impressive because the way he broke down this champion that a lot of people were afraid of or were looking to, were prepared to fight. I just think the way he did it with the style. Also, too, when you look at the standpoint of uh, the way he came after him, uh, Lopez has had a very shady type or crazy type situation in in his home life. Okay, right. when he's on point and his mental's focused, like he was the other night, he can fight anybody and bang with anybody. But when he's off his game, and maybe that's why he's talking about possibly retiring, when he's not mentally focused the right way. Who knows what can happen to him? He will lose because that same guy, there's no way he loses to Ken Bolson if they fought a rematch. No, no way. No way. No way. No way. Did he, say, he did hit in, in retirement. You think he's serious about that? I mean, I, I think two things. I think he is going to retire because I think he has some situations going on at home, trying to get custody of his child or or at least try to get some things that way. But I also think the one thing, that the, one, the other part is, um, he mentioned earlier, he did this before, they didn't want to talk about it, is he felt disrespected because he felt like ESPN was only uh, glorifying or looking after uh, either certain Mexican fighters or African-American fighters. Okay. So he felt like he was worth more, and I think he's just kind of mad or whatever, and now he's the, the the champion with all these belts in order to bring him back out of retirement. I think once he get everything together, maybe within a year, you might see him back. Because if they're offering some money, like you mentioned, I'm not fighting for a million dollars. If he is something as the, the uh, undisputed champion, uh, where he might get 10 uh, double figures or more, you might see him back. Okay. Let's move on to some other news on the Garcia, latest moves with Garcia. Take it away. Yeah. Uh, talking about Ryan Garcia, you know that he was defeated by Tank Davis earlier, Javante Davis. And uh, there's some uh, news that he's uh, changed trainers already. Uh, moving into the camp with Derek James, who also has the uh, uh, down in Dallas, ha- has his own gym down there with Earl Spence Jr., one of the Charlos brothers, possibly uh, working with Anthony Joshua. And one of the things was, was that uh, uh, Ryan Garcia just said, hey, he's always kind of want to work with him. And they said even prior, like a week before the fight against Tank Davis, he's talking about moving on. So his mind's not right. I think Derek James mentioned before that he thinks that Ryan Garcia needs to be uh, nurtured. He needs to be shown, kind of taught some things. He's young, he's talented, but he's not really fighting in a manner that he can be more explosive. 
and something that he's confident in. And I think you have to have a special guy like that. And that's kind of what Derrick James does. That's what he does for certain fighters. Put them in the best position where they feel confident and, and provide strategies and they're best prepared to handle whatever may come in the ring. You can almost see this coming after the fight and dealing with uh, De La Hoya and Bernard Hopkins, the way they kind of ended and walked away and kind of left him holding the bag after that loss against Tank Davis. And you kind of saw this happening, that he was going to make some changes in his camp because you can't feel good after that um, particular incident where you lose and everybody kind of abandoned you. Um, also, Tank Davis, um, you know, got picked up and arrested. Um, so um, he, he's going through some things too. And that's why I kept saying that the, the next possible fight for Haney would probably be um, your, your, uh, your, your play son. Um, instead of, um, you know, Tank Davis, because he has a lot of legal issues to, to kind of sort out. But um, you, I wasn't really surprised when you, when you said this, that Garcia is making some moves, um, you know, with his camp and things of that sort. Maybe it'll be better for him, and maybe uh, they will add <clears throat> a lot more reality to his boxing career. I always felt that he always thought he was better than what he was. And so uh, maybe they can really kind of help him focus, help him become a better fighter. And you never know what happens. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, all of the above. I think he's young. I think he does have talent. But I think he's probably unsure the way to, to use his talent to, to the best of his ability. And I think that's what Derrick James can do for him. And you have to have a strategy, understand what your strengths, what your weaknesses are, and what strategy you're going to use against certain fighters. So I think it was a great move for him. And you can always have people to tell you how great you are and, you know, how many – uh social media followers you have and you have this following okay but that means nothing in the ring and if he really wants to be the true champion uh that he aspires to be down the line you know for his legacy then you need to actually get with some by someone that really understands boxing and not just gonna pump you up because you got a bunch of youtube followers yeah let's go to crawford spence that's coming up in july it's fast approaching and i, I caught uh, a clip of uh, one of the press conferences where crawford um said, you know, he was he was going fishing and um, Spence immediately snapped back. It's like, you know, fishing, I ain't know, you can't catch me. I'm too big to be caught by, you know, like a fishing rod or something like that. And so mm -hmm. um, it seems like they're going back at it. I just thought that Crawford's been talking for a long time and Spence, is, I've never really seen Spence kind of really kind of talk like that. Your thoughts on mm -hmm. the tour? Yeah, they talk a little bit. Uh, they uh, had tour set up in Los Angeles and also in New York, right? Kind of promoting the fight. But the one thing that I think that you really saw is the professionalism of these two guys, right? They know they want to fight each other. They've been waiting for a while. They finally got this fight signed and they talk a little smack, of course. Yes, yeah, kind of nice, but it's never, it's not over the top. They respect one another. They both know it's going to be a hell of a show. Um, one thing I will say, nobody points this out often. Uh, they talk about other people like the promoters like Bob Rim, whatever. But this fight is being promoted by PBC, okay? And that's Al Heyman. And a lot of people don't like that. They don't like him for whatever. But the one thing that I thought was uh, ironic here is after this deal was signed, and it's almost probably going to be for it's going to be a two fight deal where Terrence Crawford is under the PBC uh, umbrella, you kind of see him coming out of a different bag that he, I never really saw him talk this way when he's with top rank right he's promoting the fight talking about legacy talking about what he's going to do but he also realizes too i think this is a because we talked about requesting the the business business acumen and who he had behind him before right but now he's starting to talk like he's feeling real comfortable with the money that he received and something to that effect where it's like this is a damn good deal this is a great fight and i'm glad to be here and I think nobody, they don't talk enough about when things are done right. Uh, Spence and Crawford apparently spoke to one another to get this deal done, to to uh, come to the table. They wanted to fight. They do want to fight one another. And we got about 44 days, 45 days before the fight. And I think it just shows you that this is going to probably be one of the biggest fights in a long time. And, and a lot of people talk about that. I think it's going to be, until we get to see what happens, it's going to be epic until that point. 
it's almost like Crawford uh, never experienced the boxing world like this before, uh, never experienced it, uh, wasn't kind of shown, seeing a new perspective. And, mm -hmm. and now, you know, uh, maybe feeling like I'm with the big hitters now. I'm, I'm truly with the big hitters now. And so it is a kind of um, strange to kind of see him in that light because he's been fighting in Nebraska for a long time. And now he's getting to, you know, see the other side of boxing, traveling around, seeing some of the, uh, the major players in boxing, um, the organizations, meeting and greeting with people, probably rubbing elbows with, with folks he haven't rubbed elbows with before. And now he's seeing the stuff that Crawford has, I mean, and uh, Spence has been seeing all along and some of the upper echelon boxers have been seeing it along. And now he's kind of uh, maybe enjoying the spoils of victory, but uh, not yet. He still got that date in July. Um, if he wants to keep this going, he got to uh, come and show it in July in that ring and uh, and try to um, uh, unseed uh, Spence, which, um, I, you know, I've been saying it before. Spence is one of my favorite fighters. I don't know if he can do it. This is a, uh, a guy that's on another level um, that I don't think Crawford has ever um, uh, fought a guy like, like Earl Spence Jr. Yeah, and I know a lot of people like Crawford, and rightfully so. Crawford has done a lot. I mean, you can always say who has he fought, but he fought whoever he did fight. He's been dominant for the yeah. most part, right? And he's earned the right to be there. So I take that. I don't take that away from him. No, no, no. And and he has the ability to to fire back. He has power, and he, he's a hell of a boxer. Uh, I heard one of the announcers try to compare him to Floyd. And I'm like Mayweather. I was uh -huh. like, hold on now, hold on now, because he's elusive like that. I was like, do you understand what? Uh, Earl Spencer's done as well. I'll say this, though. Uh, the trainer, they talked to Derek James, the trainer, and he said one thing that was very key. He says, we take nothing away from Terrence Crawford. He's going to come in. He's, he's knocked out the last 10 people we fought at welterweight. So last 10 opponents, he stopped them. And it's like, well, he's going to be number 11. But Derek James said this, and it was very important to me. He says, the thing about this is, Everybody comes with a plan and they come in the way they do. He says, but our job is to not to really try to come with a certain strategy or whatever you guys are talking about. He said, we are coming in to punish and literally physically and mentally break you down. And we do that slowly, but surely. But after a while, you get the first couple rounds. Yeah. But when we start, he started moving forward. And start coming at you and start hitting you with stuff that you're not used to. You're gonna have, he said, I'm literally, he said, Earl Spence is literally looking to break his will. He said, that's what he does. He said, when they fought Ugas, he said, Ugas was probably one of the most difficult fighters because he did everything and he had a lot going on for him because what he overcame and everything, all that too. And he said he was very elusive as well. And he said, I told Earl Spence Jr. The only way we can beat this man, because he's hungry. He's come from all kinds of places. He, you know, he's overcome a lot. He says, we're literally going to have to physically beat and break him mentally down. And we're going to do this by slowly but surely, each round, taking away what he likes to do, walking forward, and literally punishing him to the point where he wants to quit. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> You want to fight this, dude? You're clutching your pearls as you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh. I was like, damn, I'm scared. You know, I'm not even in the ring. I said, wow. It was, it was, man. It was like we're gonna, we're gonna. We, have you not seen me see him bust up audible bones? I'm like, ooh. And it's not to say that Terrence Crawford is not dynamite, but I mean, you pick and choose who you want. But uh, we seen Terrence Crawford get hit a few times. He's been in trouble a little bit. I don't know. You hey, you have the right to your opinion, whatever you like to do. But that Earl Spence is no joke. The man been through car accidents. He had surgery on his eye, and he said, "Look, like he said before, he said you can run your mouth, you can talk about the fish, and you gonna need a submarine. But I know this, I'm coming for you." And like he told him before. Man down, you know, strap down. He said, Man down, man down. I got I got these straps. I went and got these straps first. And he, he told him, I'm coming for your damn belt. That's a grown man. 
I mean, That's a grown man, bro. We can't. It got to end it on that one because uh, I'm, I'm a little scared to say anything else <laughs> after I hear. <laughs> He's Ice Water. I'm Puma, and this is the Fight Game. <laughs>